If you have your Bibles with you, uh, please turn with me to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4 this morning, I want to be looking at a very well-known passage, and that is the parable of the sower. Um, and Jesus calls it that in, in Matthew, he calls it the parable of the sower, but it's also quite appropriately called the parable of the soils. I think it's important for us to consider a, a well-known passage like this, because what often happens He speaks about the secret of the kingdom, and then verse 13 to 20, he describes the significance of the parable. And in a sense, this is the most important of all the parables. It's a parable about parables, uh, because it's meant to interpret all the other parables. Uh, some will hear, they will hear the word, but they won't understand, but others will hear, they will understand, they will receive the word and, and bear fruit. And so let's read uh, this passage, uh, Mark chapter 4. Verse 1 to 20. This is God's word. Hear it. Again he began to teach besides the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea, and the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables. soil, and immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seed fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirty and sixtyfold and hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see but not perceive, and may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven." And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground. The one who, the one who when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then, when tribulation and persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires of other things enter in and choke the word. And it proves unfruitful. But those... Sown on the good soil are those who it and bear fruit thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. Only so far in the reading of God's word, may you form us to its truth. Now let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do draw near to you this morning, confessing that our hearts are deceitful. It's deceitful above all things. So sick, who can understand it? Dear Lord, we recognize that it's so easy for our hearts to go wayward, to go astray after the things of this world. It's delights, it's pleasure. Taken up in the things of self, the flesh. 
It's so easy for the heart to trust even not look to you and not rely upon you. Yet, dear Lord, we pray that this morning you would stir within our you. We pray that we would be like that tree planted with, with water, planted in fertile ground, with its roots stretching, with it bearing much fruit. We, heart, we pray, dear Lord, that our hearts would yield a, a harvest for your glory to the praise and honor of your name. We pray, dear Lord, that even this morning as we hear the word, that it would have an effect upon us, that we would hear it and receive it and understand it, perceive it, it would produce fruit in our lives. Dear Lord, we thank you that you are able to do this. We are thankful, thankful to you that you have done this. We know that you have called us out of darkness into light. You have called us out of death and you have given us life in your Son. You have washed us clean of our sin. The way that you've taken out that heart of stone, a heart that rebels against you, and you've given us a heart of flesh to know you and understand you and to walk with you and to love you and serve you. And even this morning, dear Lord, our desire is to praise you and honor you. Dear Lord, we do consider those in our midst who are going through difficulties. We do pray for the church body that as we undergo trials and difficulties, that we would be a people who trust in you, who rely not upon our own understanding, not upon our own strength, but who rely upon your sovereignty, your goodness, your love. We think of those who are struggling with sickness and disease, with cancer. We pray that you would meet them in their need. We think of our brother Peter and our brother Rian, and we ask the Lord to have mercy upon them, that you would give them strength in their ailments to endure this fight. Dear Lord, that you would remove this cancer from their bodies. Think of those who are still grieving the lo loss of loved ones. Dear Lord, we cannot at times comprehend the, the searing loss. Yet, dear Lord, we know that you are a God who delights to draw near. You're a God of comfort. You're a God who upholds and strengthens. And so we pray, dear Lord, meet with your people. Give them joy and peace, even in these days. We think of our elderly, especially also at this time, many struggling with ailments, many struggling with loneliness. And we do pray, dear Lord, that you would have mercy, uh, that they too would know your grace and your peace, that they would too would see your hand and your faithfulness at this time. Dear Lord, especially our hearts go out to our families at this time. We see how marriages are under strain. We see how marriages are, are cracking and some are splitting. And we pray, dear Lord, have mercy. We pray, dear Lord, that you would uh, remove hardened hearts, uh, give hearts that are alive, hearts that are sensitive to your word, hearts that are your word. Lord, have mercy upon our marriages. Bless our, our husbands to be godly and upright. Uh, wives, uh, great love and submission to their husbands, to, to love and serve you even. We pray that you would have mercy upon our children. We pray that they would come to know you and serve you. That they would fear your name above all other things. And you, Lord, that your, your spirit would fill their hearts and, and draw them to yourself. We think of our youth and our young adults, and we know that the world has uh, the flashy lights of this world are so attractive. We pray, dear Lord, that you would safeguard them and uh, draw them to you that they would be equally yoked, and you, Lord, that their desire would be for godliness, for uprightness. You, Lord, have mercy upon us as a church people. Help us as a church family to, to walk in love, to walk in obedience, to walk with humility and, and walk with righteousness. Help us, we pray, and we pray that we would be a church family that is pleasing before you, one that uh, knows your favor, one that knows something of your blessing. We pray that you'd add to our numbers those who would be saved, that you'd grow the work of the Lord here, that truly we would see uh, your hand uh, here at Bethany. 
so that we would praise you and adore you, not because we are so great, not because we are so perfect, but because you are awesome. You are so worthy of praise and worthy of adoration. And dear Lord, even now as we turn our attention and our focus to your word, as we consider this parable of the sower, uh, we pray that you would speak to us. Dear Lord, I feel my own weakness. I recognize my own shortcomings. I pray that you would help all of us in our shortcomings to, to have the ears that hear, eyes that see and understand, hearts that are receptive to the word, so that we would bear fruit to the praise and honor of your name. Help us, we pray, in Christ's wonderful name. Amen. You might have heard of this saying, uh, Socrates, the old Greek philosopher, attributed with this saying, he said this, life is not worth living. I think that has a ring of truth to it. Uh, See, his idea was this, that when we deprive ourselves of understanding ourselves and understanding our world, then we really deprive ourselves of meaning and purpose. See, when we deprive ourselves of creation, we are in a sense no better than the beasts of the field. And thirteen five. Examine yourselves to see whether or not you are in the faith. He says, test yourself. Even when it comes to the Lord's Supper, he says in First Corinthians eleven twenty eight, uh, let a person examine himself. Even when it comes to your works, to your deeds, you are to test that. Galatians six four. He says that let each one test his own work. See, the scriptures and God calls upon you to test yourself, to examine yourself. In in fact, based on all of this, I I think it would be right to say that the unexamined life is a spiritually impoverished life. It's a barren life. One pastor, uh, Nick Batzig, he he, he pointed this out. He said, the reality is that most are fairly proficient when it comes to examining their jobs and examining their life situations and examining their bank accounts and examining the actions of others, yet we are often quite negligent when it comes to examining our own hearts, our own lives, and the result is, I would argue, a life of spiritual impoverishment. Now, why this emphasis upon self-examination? Well, because this parable almost forces us to examine ourselves. Parables, by the way, are meant to do that. They're meant to confront us and engage us, to to challenge our thinking, so that they might not just promote further thinking, but promote further and renewed action. And so the question that this parable forces upon us is this. What are you doing with what you've heard? In fact, that seems to be the emphasis in this parable. The Greek word for listen and and hear is the same, and it occurs 13 times in this passage. And and it's very clearly the dominant theme. It it starts this parable in verse 3 and ends with this parable in verse 9. See, the question therefore seems to be this. What are you doing with what you've heard? Or, Or more particularly, What are you doing with the gospel that has been preached to you? Is it producing fruit? Is it leading to spiritual growth? Are you a spiritually fruitful person or are you spiritually barren? Are you one of those who who hears the word, hears the gospel, yet fails to grow? Or are you one of those people who hears and understands and and grows spiritually? See, these are the kind of questions that this parable forces upon us. 
These are the kind of questions by which we ought to examine ourselves this morning. We need to see whether or not there is spiritual life within us. Whether or not there is spiritual vitality. Whether or not the, the gospel is producing growth. What are you doing with what you have heard? What are you doing with the gospel? And see, there are three main uh, images in this parable that I want to consider. The seed, the soil, and, and the sower. Uh, and and even, oh, even though the, the emphasis is quite clear upon the soil in this parable, I, I do think it's necessary to consider also the seed and the sower. And so let's consider first the seed. Uh, what does the seed in this parable represent? Well, Jesus tells us in verse 14, it's the, the sower sows the word. But the question still remains, what word is he speaking about? Well, in Luke 8, the, par- the, the Lucan version of this parable, Luke 8, 11, says it is the word of God. That as the word of the kingdom. Or even consider verse 11 and 12 of Mark 4. There we read this, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see but not perceive, and may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgotten. And so we see there seems to be a word here, a message that is veiled to outsiders, Yet this message relates, one, to the kingdom and to forgiveness. I suggest to you this word is actually the word of the gospel. The word spoken of here is the gospel that is sown. In fact, remember how Jesus started his ministry in in Mark 1, verse 14 and 15? It says there, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God, saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, Repent and believe the gospel. See, the word that is sown is the gospel. It is the good news that Jesus Christ is the created king. It's the good news that the king has come to conquer sin, Satan, and death. And he's come to conquer it by, by giving his life. His life as a ransom for sinners. His life to save his people. It's the good news that the king has come to bring healing and and forgiveness and and peace with God. It's the good news that the king has come to reign, therefore, as Lord and Savior. See, this is the word that is sown. This is the gospel which may be veiled to the outsider who is perishing, but to those who have ears to hear, it is the power of God. It is this message, this seed that brings life to spiritually dead hearts. And it's quite appropriate, don't you think, that, that the gospel is likened to a seed? Now, when you think of a seed, it's quite small, it's quite insignificant, yet it has the creative power for life. From the seed comes a shoot, then a root is formed, then a stem, and from that stem there's come branches and, and leaves and even fruit. In a small seed, there is potential for life. And how much more so is that not true of the gospel? Yes, it might seem small. It might seem insignificant. It might seem foolish to this world. Yet, it has the power to produce life. Not just life, but everlasting life. Life without end. Life with peace and joy with God. See, the gospel... The word of the kingdom, when it is sown in the right soil, produces a harvest that abounds in eternal life. That's the seed that Jesus is speaking of here. But let's consider the soils, and this is the the main focus of this parable and this message. Jesus here explains the significance of the parable, and it's very clear that the emphasis is on the soils. See, the state and the condition of the soil determines ultimately the growth and fruitfulness of the seed. If the soil is hard and and shallow and and infested with thorns, then the seed won't take root. It won't grow. It won't produce fruit. 
But, but if the soil is softened, if it is tilled, if it is worked, then the seed not only takes root, but grows and produces fruit. And let us realize that Jesus puts this picture of these four different soils before us, which represent four different people or four different responses. In fact, when you look at Matthew and Luke's version of this parable, we see that those four soils represent four different hearts. And let's not miss the significance of that. Jesus presents us with this parable because he wants us to examine our hearts. Which soil represents you? How have you responded to what has been sown? What is the state and the condition of your heart? Are you producing fruit? And so let's examine ourselves this morning. I want us to ask ourselves four questions. Four questions. The first one is this. Do you have a hardened heart? Do you have a hardened heart? I can ask that question because in verse 4, Jesus speaks of seed that falls on the path. That is, the seed falls on hardened and compressed ground. And therefore, the seed barely enters into the soil. It merely lies upon the surface, and therefore, the birds come in and devour it. Well, some people are like that hardened path. They hear the gospel with hardened hearts, and the word is impervious to them. It doesn't enter in. See, they may, they may hear the gospel, yet it has no impact. They may hear the gospel again and again and again, yet it makes no impression. Their mind, their conscience, their heart instead remains indifferent. And we need to realize a person with a hardened heart has a hardened heart for one reason and one reason only. And that's their sin. Not only are they sinners by nature, but they're sinners by choice and practice. They've walked the path of wickedness. They've suppressed the truth in unrighteousness. They've given way to impurity and lust and, and pride and covetousness and idolatry. And therefore, they are easy prey for Satan. They may hear the word, but Satan comes and he snatches away. He, he leads them into temptation and he ruins them. That's why Jesus says in verse 15, when they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word. Luke describes it in 8, 9, 12. He says, the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and not be saved. The sad reality is, this is true of most people. Most people have a hardened condition. Most people are not merely ignorant of the gospel, but they're totally indifferent to it. They live in God's world without a care for God. Thomas Guthrie describes them this way. He says this, They are without God in the world. He is in the sky above and the earth beneath them. In the air they But where most he should be, he's not in their thoughts. He's not in their hearts. They are as hard as the paths they walk on. And beloved, let us realize this is perhaps even true of some people in the church. How many sit under the preaching of the word? How many hear the gospel time and time again? How many are taught the gospel in Sunday school the gospel has no fruit. It has no effect. It makes no impression. It's in the one year, year and out the other. J.C. Ryle describes them this way. Sunday after Sunday, they feed from their hearts. Week after week, they live on without faith, without fear, without knowledge, without grace feeling nothing and caring nothing, taking no interest in religion as if Christ never died. Is that you this morning? Are you unmoved and unbothered by the gospel? Are you indifferent to the word of the kingdom, the news of the king who has come to save sinners? 
If you've heard the gospel again and again, yet it makes no difference, it has no effect, then guess what, my friend? You perhaps have a hardened heart. But perhaps you're saying to yourself, no, that's not you. Let me ask a second question this morning. Do you have a shallow heart? Do you have a shallow heart? Again, I can ask that question because in verse 5, Jesus speaks of seed that, that falls on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil. There's some soil, but not much. And immediately it springs up since it had no depth of soil. See, although this ground is still rocky, there is at least a thin layer of soil. And because there is that thin layer of soil, there, there is the seed initially seems to grow quite quickly. And Jesus gives this interpretation in verse 16, namely that this soil refers to those who hear the word and who almost immediately receive it with joy. See, unlike the previous hardened soil, unlike the person with a hardened heart, there is hope here. There's some receptivity to the seed. There's some acceptance of the gospel. In fact, there's, there's a joyful acceptance of the gospel. After all, who wouldn't want to receive the gospel? Who wouldn't want to take hold of its blessing? Who wouldn't want to take hold of its, its gifts, like eternal life, of forgiveness, of the hope of glory? Who wouldn't want forgiveness and peace with God? Most do. But here's the problem. There, there's no depth. The gospel hasn't actually taken root. The gospel hasn't been embedded in the heart. And how do we know that? Well, when trials and afflictions and hardship come, they reject the gospel as soon as they accepted it. Verse 6, Jesus says, And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. And he explains that in verse 17, when tribulation and, uh, and, and persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. Luke 8, 13 says, but these have no root. They believe for a while, and in, time, in, in, in times of testing, they fall away. And the idea is this, this person has a shallow heart. He accepts the gospel with a shallow faith. Accepts the gospel for all its blessings, it denies the gospel as soon as the going gets tough. We see an example of this, don't we, when, when Jesus enters into Jerusalem. Do you remember how the crowds gathered and how they praised and worshipped? Do you remember what they said? How they sang to him? They said, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Do you remember what happened a week later? Those same crowds shouting, crucify him, crucify him. See, those crowds and many today have a shallow faith. They receive the gospel with joy for all its blessings, but as soon as the calls of Christ become too much, they re let go. They reject him. Richard Glover sums up these people this way. He says, it is only part of Christ they have received. He's saving power, but not his sovereign control. It is only part of the Christian's life they've accepted. It's comforts, but not its cross. It's hopes, not its self-denial. It's rest, but not its stern duties. It's part of the heart that accepts part of the Savior and adopts part of the gospel. Again, the question for us to wrestle this morning, is this you? Perhaps at first you rejoiced in the gospel. You enjoyed the preaching of the word. You enjoyed looking forward to coming to church and sitting under the preaching of the word, worshiping God. You delighted in the things of God. But now you give the gospel no thought. You have little patience for preaching. He preaches too long. You have no time for church, no time for worship. You care little for the things of God. What's happened? What's happened is you're displaying some evidence that perhaps you have a shallow heart. You have a shallow faith where the gospel actually hasn't taken root. For many, unfortunately, their faith in Christ 
and their joy in the gospel is like a flower placed in a vase of water. At first it's beautiful and vibrant, but slowly and surely it dies away and withers. Why? Because there's no root. Is that you this morning? Perhaps that's not you this morning. Perhaps you're saying to yourself, that's not me. I believe the gospel. Let me ask you the third question. Do you have a crowded heart? You have a crowded heart. In verse 7, Jesus speaks of seed that, that seems to fall into fertile soil. Unfortunately, however, that soil is crowded and cluttered with thorns that seemingly choke the life out of the seed. And what are these thorns? Jesus explains in verse 18 and 19. And others are the ones sown among the thorns. There are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word and proves unfruitful. See, a crowded heart is one that's overwhelmed with worldliness. Overwhelmed with the problems of this world, its cares, its anxieties. Overwhelmed by the possessions of this world, its riches. Overwhelmed by the pleasures of this world, the delights of the flesh. Think even of the rich young ruler. He had an earnest desire for Christ. He, He couldn't part with his worldly possessions. Instead, he parted with Christ. See, his love for the world choked out any good and right desire for Christ. And it is these thorns of worldliness, beloved, if left untouched, unattended, unmortified, it is these thorns that will choke and hinder the work of the gospel in your life. How many Christians do we not see like this? How many Christians have confessed faith in Christ They believe the gospel, yet they never seem to grow. They never seem to progress in the Christian walk. They never seem to produce fruit. Why is that? Well, according to Christ, it's because of worldliness. Worldliness that chokes and kills the seed of the gospel. Instead of a wholehearted devotion to Christ, the crowded heart is a divided heart. It's a heart that wants to love God and it wants to love the world. It wants to to cling to Christ and also cling to its sin. It wants to enjoy every spiritual blessing in Christ and enjoy every worldly delight. And we must not think that, that, well, at least this person's a believer, right? We must not think that, oh, well, at least they've believed the gospel and they might not be growing, but at least they've confessed faith in Christ. Beloved, do not be deceived. That kind of thinking will not only kill the seed of the gospel, but it will ruin the soul. James 4 verse 4 says this, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or 1 John 2, 15 and 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away with all its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. See, the love to love the world, if you love the world, you will die with the world. See, Christ will have all of you or he will have none of you. He either will have your entire heart or he will reject your heart. And so let's ask the question again. Do you have a crowded heart? Do you have a heart overwhelmed by worldliness? A heart divided between Christ and this world? I I would venture to say that most Christians are in the danger of this. Most Christians need to be concerned about a divided heart. If we're honest with ourselves, as Christians, we sometimes find our hearts overwhelmed by the world, don't we? 
We find our devotion divided. We find our spiritual growth almost stagnant. We, we get too busy to read the Word. We get too busy to pray and, and, and seek His face. We get too busy to attend the means of grace like church and communion. And what is the result of that neglect? The result is slowly but surely your spiritual life drains away. Slowly but surely life is choked out by worldly preoccupation. To the point where you don't even see that you've stopped growing. You don't even see that you haven't even borne any fruit. And the question you really need to wrestle with is this. Does that bother you? Are you comfortable with the world in your heart? Are you comfortable with becoming spiritually stagnant? Are you comfortable with a lack of growth and a lack of fruitfulness? If you are, be very concerned. Of having a heart, a crowded heart, we ought to desire to have a fruitful heart. And that's the final question to ask. Do you have a fruitful heart? In verse 8, he speaks of the seed that, that fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing, yielding 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. In verse 20, he says that the seed sown in good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit. Luke 8, 15 even says, as for that seed in the good soil, those are the ones who hear the word and hold fast to the word with an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. See, Jesus here is describing a good heart that, that when the seed of the gospel is sown, the heart actually does something. It doesn't remain indifferent. It doesn't wither away under trials. It doesn't stay stagnant in its growth. No, the gospel takes root. It, it grows. It bears fruit. It produces a blessed harvest for the kingdom. For some, it's a harvest of 30-fold, for others, 60, and for others, even a 100-fold. But regardless of, of the quantity of this harvest, the undeniable reality of this kind of heart is the fact that it continues to bear fruit. In fact, it's quite interesting that in the original language, when Jesus describes the first three soils, he uses a particular verb, a form, and when he describes the fourth soil, he changes the tense. And the idea simply is this. The gospel doesn't have a superficial, shallow, short-lived, and stagnant effect in this heart. No, instead the gospel has a real, deep, lasting, fruitful effect. See, those with a good heart, with a fruitful heart, receive the gospel, and it grows. He bears fruit continually. And what are those fruit? It's the fruit of faith, true faith, lasting faith. It's the fruit of love for Christ, where you grow deeper in your affections for Christ. It's the fruit of a hatred for sin, a despising of unholiness. It's the fruit of righteousness. See, someone has quite rightly said that this parable is all about hearing that leads to productive living. Beloved, is that you this morning? Has your hearing of the gospel led to faithful and fruitful living? How have you responded to the gospel? What have you done with what you've heard? And you need to answer that question honestly. Perhaps this morning you've come to see that you have a hardened heart. Perhaps you've come to see that actually your faith has been quite shallow. Perhaps you've come to see that your heart has been crowded by this world. What are you to do? Well, this is the good news. These responses, the, these four soils aren't set in stone. They aren't static because it's possible for a hardened heart to be softened. It's, it's possible for a shallow heart to be deepened by God's grace. It's possible for a crowded heart to be cleared of all thorns. And how? By turning to this sower, 
And that leads me to the final point. I'll say this very quickly. We've looked at the seed. We've looked at the soils. But we have to remember the sower. Who is the sower? Well, it's none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. If you look at Matthew's uh, version of this in Matthew 13, uh, the, Matthew of the, uh, the parable of the sower is followed by the parable of the weeds. And in that context, it's very clear that Christ sows the seeds. And He brings in the harvest. See, Christ is the sower of the seed who not only proclaims the good news, but he fundamentally procures the good news. With his death and and life and resurrection, he accomplishes salvation. He He therefore is the sovereign sower, if you will, who has authority and power to bring life. He tills the ground of your heart through the Spirit who convicts of sin. He pours out grace upon grace to nourish that word. He removes the thorns and that hinders your growth. He is the one that gives growth. And so if you're here this morning and you recognize the state of your heart, you need to turn to Him. You need to trust in Him. You need to go to Him and say, Lord, take this hard heart from me. Lord, help me to take hold of the gospel. Let it take root in me. Replace this this love of this world with a deep longing for you, a deep love for you. Beloved, this parable calls you to examine yourself, but not just so that you see your need, but that you would turn to Christ, that you'd trust Him, that you'd put your faith and your hope in Him. May we be those who, who hear, who have ears that hear, who see and perceive, who believe the gospel. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have said that you search the heart, you test us, you see all that is within us. And I do pray, dear Lord, that even this morning we would see our hearts. That we would know and understand our standing before you. And if there is an unbeliever even here this morning who has heard the gospel, they've sat in church, I pray, dear Lord, that you would convict them. That you bring conviction to their heart, that you till the soil of their heart so that they would be broken by their sin. Dear Lord, that they would turn to you. They would turn to you for forgiveness of sin and healing, for salvation. Dear Lord, even if there is a believer here this morning who has, who has grown cold, who has allowed the thorns of this world to snuff out any life, any growth, I do pray, dear Lord, that your Spirit would lead that person to be bothered by their sin that we would long to be rid of these thorns that, that hinder us, these weeds that distract us from the glories of Christ. Lord, have mercy upon us. Cause your word to germinate in our hearts and to produce fruit, to produce a harvest for your kingdom in this place that all redounds to your glory. Dear Lord, we do pray that the word would go out this morning and would accomplish your purposes for the glory of your name and the good of those who have ears that hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to stand and sing our last song, Show Us Christ. And so when they're ready, let's stand and sing together.